All right, can you all hear me out in the back? Okay. Great, thank you. So first of all, thank you for the introduction, uh, Leo, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here and talk to you about uh, you know, the work and how it relates to the RV community. Uh, very excited to be here. Couldn't have asked for better weather, and so thank you all for choosing to be here rather than outside, right? <laughs> So the, the title of my talk is Challenges and Opportunities in Design and Operation of Intelligent Cyber-Physical Systems. Uh, so a little bit of, about myself, uh, Cyber-Physical Systems or CPS have been part of my life uh, one way or another for the past several years. And I took a little bit of a nonlinear path to get to where I am today. Uh, I started in the industry actually uh, as a practitioner and back when CPS wasn't even called CPS but I was doing related things like uh, embedded controls for diesel engine applications and industrial automation for a actually a manufacturing of the, those uh, engines. And I also spent a little bit of time uh, as an intern at Bosch and uh, I took some liberty to mention Toyota there because uh, I had a thesis committee member from Toyota and we had a research collaboration. And I benefited from you know, visiting their model-based design uh, group in Ann Arbor several times. Uh, so I'll acknowledge that you know, that has uh, led to my perspective. Uh, I also spent some time as an academic researcher doing CPS research uh, in graduate school at Penn and Carnegie Mellon, where my uh, PhD thesis was uh, on the intersection of formal methods, uh, software and system architectures for CPS, and uh, model-based design and heterogeneity of modeling formalisms, etc. And uh, for the past several years, uh, I've been a CPS research scientist at MathWorks. So uh, in a sense, what I want to talk about today is my own perspective that is shaped by my career trajectory along these three different roles. And uh, it's nice to be sitting as a tool developer in between the two, uh, two sides. And uh, at times, the, 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 the trade-off uh, can be quite large. So for example, when I was working at uh, Cummins, you know, I was fortunate enough to work on you know, many different applications, uh, visiting them uh, and actually seeing them being used at runtime, right? Doing the real runtime uh, analysis and verification uh, in the wild, if you will. Uh, the most interesting of which, uh, probably the most uh, ex, uh, you know, uh, harshest of the environments was a coal mine where you see, uh, you know, a little, oh, wrong, wrong button. Uh, you see like a SUV for scale, you know, reference of how big these things are. And uh, so I took this image from Google search, but I, I, I did something very similar where there is, there is a, oh, wrong button again, sorry about that, where, uh, you know, the, there is a diesel engine here and another one here, but uh, uh, while we were commissioning a new uh, prototype, you know, uh, the runtime monitoring me meant actually going physically installing sensors on this and, you know, hooking up my laptop and, and you know, s seeing whether it's doing the right thing, right? And all the while, while this thing is in operation, dumping, you know, the new buckets of coal into the uh, dump truck and the coal is basically, you know, you know flying everywhere in your face. And here you can see a little bit that, like the, the environment is so harsh that uh, it's so hot. The coal is naturally simmering. It's like 50 degrees Celsius or so. So here's a visual proof that I did it, you know. <laughs> very, very, very proud of that. Uh, on the other end of spectrum, maybe the most academic thing I've done is you know, talking temporal logic and uh, monitoring in front of uh, you know, Ed Clark the year he won the Turing Award. Uh, you know, so that was a little unnerving, but I survived that. And uh, since I'm wearing the same glasses in this picture, I, I'll make the joke that it's the same lens but a very different perspective on the problem. <laughs> And uh, right now it's nice to be, like I said, in between uh, the two, two sides of the, the, the trade-off where our tools are thankfully you know, used also by academics uh, as well as industry practitioners. Uh, how many of you have heard of MathWorks? Oh. Okay, almost everyone. How many of you have used MATLAB? Okay, and Simulink? Okay, fewer ones, all right. So uh, I bet not, not that many of you would know that we have a very close connection to uh, Alan Turing himself via this gentleman, uh, Alan Wilkins, who was a uh, you know, Turing awardee in 1970. But not just that, he actually 
personally worked with Alan Turing at the National Physical Laboratory, and his uh, Turing Award lecture in 1970s, uh, you know, his perspective as a numerical analyst uh, working with Alan Turing, uh, you know, originally they envisioned, you know, the use of uh, what he called ACE or automatic uh, computing engine uh, to do, you know, you know, n numerical analysis or what we call these days linear algebra type of problems. And they actually built a smaller version of uh, what Turing proposed as ACE, uh, which was called pilot ACE, and he worked on it. And uh, Later on, you know, here is uh, the co-founder of our company, Cleve Moller, you know, working with, uh, with Alan Wilkins. And, uh, you know, in, in, in this blog post, he, he, he basically attributes uh, Wilkinson's contributions to the IcePack project, which indirectly, in addition to LinPack, uh, were motivations of MATLAB. And the original, you know, algorithms were contributed definitely from, from his work. So, so from there, uh, you know, today uh, the, the tools uh, are used, you know, in, across a wide variety of applications in industry, like I said. And it, this is just the spread. Uh, you can see that many of these uh, have, you know, some connection with CPS, right? Although, although CPS is not explicitly called out. And uh, so that brings me to the outline of my talk. So what I wanted to talk about today is, uh, you know, Challenges and opportunities, right? Uh, so that's the that's kind of throughout the talk uh, of design and operation. So I, I sort of split it into two 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 main sections. Design is basically when you use simulation as a proxy for the runtime. So that's the runtime verification connection, and then uh, talk about you know real runtime at real runtime. You know while the system is op in operation, right? Uh, but before I do that, uh, I, I want to talk about uh, a f you know sort of a feature classification of cyber physical systems and what do I mean by intelligent cyber physical systems, right? So, uh, cyber physical systems is of course an umbrella term and uh, it's not a precise definition. So, uh, how do we even you know think fundamentally about these systems, right? So, so uh, you know here is one definition from uh, Helen Gill and Kishan Bahedi who are uh, sort of the CPS program directors at NSF, and uh, they say, you know, these are systems with integrated computational and physical capabilities that uh, will interact with humans through new modalities. And in particular, uh, these are the characteristics that you often see mentioned, which is uh, the synergy between computation, communication, and control, right? So we can just, you know, imagine those as being sort of a Venn diagram of, you know, the, the RGB colors and, uh, you know, go with that uh, representation, uh, representation for a little bit. Uh, so on the, on, the, on the control side, of course, this is what lets us do uh, interesting things uh, by closing the loop around, you know, the physical, actual physical environment. Uh, so on the one end, you can sense what is going on in the environment. For example, you know, monitor some variable like the speed of your vehicle, right? On the other side, you can uh, act on environment by injecting something, usually a control input. Uh, for example, you know, the decision of, uh, you know, whether to accelerate or brake and throttle command. And uh, of course, uh, the, the loop in the closing the loop is basically, you know, making the action be a function of what you saw in the physics, right? Uh, from the sensing side. And here uh, the example would be uh, that you take the action based on, you know, comparison of what you saw with respect to a particular set point in case of cruise control, right? So if we sort of keep that, uh, you know, notion of automatic control as a, as a reference or starting point, let's just uh, see where, you know, computation and communication have enabled, you know, new levels of adding intelligence into, into our systems. So on the... Uh, Computation side, you, you of course know that you know Moore's law has, has been the main uh, enabler of you know uh, cheap, reliable, fast compute power. Uh, here again, you see the vertical axis is uh, on, on the logarithmic scale, so this is exponential, uh, and you see uh, interesting uh, you know statistics. This is already 10 years old now, but uh, the cost of printing a single character in a newspaper is more than printing a transistor, right? 10 years ago already. And in terms of uh, annual production, we, we produce, uh, already used to produce, you know, more transistors uh, per year than we, we would grow grains of rice, right? So just to give you uh, in perspective. And uh, 
that has seen basically the mega trend of you know software in everything. So these are you know no longer your desktop computers. So uh, you know all kinds of applications where you have a real uh, connection with the physical environment and are taking actions. Uh, at the same time, on the computation axis, the the internet connectivity speed uh, has also exponentially increased, and uh, you know sometimes. It, it, uh, on the left hand side you see the nielsen's law which is uh, you know sort of measuring this exponential increase in the speed and on the right hand side you see metcalf's law which is also used uh, to to sort of say that the the value of a network is proportional to the square of the nodes number of nodes in it so and, uh, you know the equivalent of uh, moore's law on the communication side so then uh, if we had this sort of uh, a block diagram for our automatic control, the next thing you can do on the computational side is add adaptation, right? So here you're not just sensing and taking action, but uh, also you know, learning patterns of what's going on in your system. And here an example would be the, the Nest learning thermostat or, or you know, adaptive cruise control where now you can adapt to what's going on in your environment. So you're following a particular car and uh, at a particular speed, and the, the car in front of you leaves or changes lanes, then you adapt and you know, try to follow another car that identify what's going on. Uh, yet next level is uh, when you add deliberate planning. Here, uh, you know, again, we have, we have made a start in some limited context, but we're not quite fully there yet. So uh, we can call these two classes adaptive and autonomous, uh, respectively. And uh, really looking into the future, you know, there is uh, you know, sort of the more awareness aspect where you can, uh, if you think of intelligent beings, then they can you know, reflect upon themselves and you know, think about, oh, I, I drove yesterday, that, that wasn't you know, quite a good driving, I should be a better driver, or I should eat uh, better to be more healthy. You know, those kinds of things are definitely not there in today's systems. And right now, uh, it's the humans who are doing the reflection part, right? Uh, but, but I just put there for uh, completeness. And on the computation side, it, it, it has enabled basically to do uh, not just one, but n of them at, uh, at the same time synergistically. So the, the, the equivalent of automatic is uh, distributed control systems, but uh, you know, as we uh, add more and more intelligence, uh, we start getting into you know, uh, these connected uh, ensembles and you know, collaborative agents, so there's more of an agent-based notion uh, where these work together. And uh, you know, we can add more adjectives for, for the classes of things, uh, reflexively active, reasoned, and reflective, right? And that's sort of what we have been presenting uh, in, in some of our position papers uh, and, and panels on this topic so far. So uh, some of the references in, ca in case you're interested. So then let's talk about uh, how we do runtime verification for these uh, things uh, at simulation or design time, right? Because uh, if you think of these systems, uh, these are complex systems that are not you know, designed in vacuum, right? So, so you need sort of uh, for us to try it out in a, in a computer simulation environment. Uh, so many times this is of, uh, often called model-based design, right? And it's presented as a V. Uh, it, it is again an idealized uh, representation of the, of the design workflow uh, where you can think the vertical axis as sort of the level of detail in your system and uh, the horizontal axis as time, right? And it's, it's never a straight line and, and you know, there's loops back and forth, but this is a you know, simplified mental model of what's going on. So you start with requirements, uh, then you, you know, define it, what elements of your systems are in terms of arch architecture and how they connect together. And then uh, you go further the, uh, uh, drilling down and you know, actually design the components. So here, uh, after you have you know, done the, the functional design, uh, then you have uh, implementation part, which is basically you know using the same design to 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 maybe automatically generate code, and on the right hand side you basically have lots of testing. So you know at the component level you have unit testing, at the architectural level you have integration testing, and at the at the system level you might have uh, acceptance testing or certification, you know those kinds of things. And uh, you know, by model-based design we mean that uh, we use the, uh, computational models throughout this design process. Right. Uh, 
So for cyber-physical systems, we need you know, lots of different uh, levels of abstraction uh, based on what sort of thing you're you know, trying to design. Uh, and there are multiple different modeling formalisms. Uh, so there's, there could be textual code-based uh, code uh, you know, things like you know, C code or MATLAB in our case. Uh, or if you're doing control design or filtering, then you would have you know, sort of block diagrams of uh, you know, continuous time or discrete time uh, variety respectively. If you're trying to do sort of uh, high-level protocol design, then you might have something like a state chart formalism. Uh, uh, if you're de designing the physics of the system, you'll have uh, a causal equation-based modeling, uh, such as Simscape. Uh, and finally, you know, you'll also have uh, like discrete event, uh, sort of messages, queuing theory, you know, kind of uh, formalisms for uh, network-level modeling of your, you know, communication channels, but also increasingly as, you know, traffic modeling, et cetera, applications, right? Uh, so that's sort of the lay of the land. Uh, and we use uh, various different kinds of simulations to, to have uh, increasingly faithful proxies for runtime behavior of how the systems will operate. Right? At the top is just the model in the, what, the, what people call model in the loop simulation or just desktop simulation of your model. Uh, software in the loop is basically you generate code and then you know, bring that act generated code back into a model and test that model. Uh, processor in the loop is basically you use the generated code on the processor that we will uh, use, uh, oftentimes uh, either in uh, communication with your uh, simulation environment or in a, in a you know, environment that emulates the inst instruction set. And hardware in the loop is basically going uh, a, a next step and actually using plant on a real-time real hardware, right? And increasingly you see now uh, in addition to these things, a new new sort of modality where you have you know, sort of gaming engine in the loop where you're trying to visualize uh, you know, what's going on in the, in, the, in the physical environment. So the gaming engines have built-in physics in terms of you know, collision and those kinds of things. So uh, you can have you know, things like co-simulation of the gaming engine and the dynamics of your model. So here at the bottom you see uh, the Unreal Gaming Engine being co-simulated with, uh, you know, simulating simulation environment. Uh, if you think in terms of uh, what's going on in the, uh, uh, on the semantic side uh, for all of these different abstractions, and uh, you have, you know, different kinds of uh, time axes as well as signal domain axes. Uh, they can be continuous or discrete and, you know, can have one or multiple events at the same time, uh, you know, all of these things that, that act together. And uh, these are, again, examples of where you would typically find it. Uh, but again, it's a, it's, a, it's a simplification because, of course, th there is more to this. You can, you can have this sort of uh, thing in, in MATLAB by just calling ODE solvers, et cetera. So it's more complicated than this. Uh, but again, what I'd like to, to mention here is that even, even when you have uh, uh, the notion of you know, continuous time, it's, it's just uh, an approximation with the variable steps uh, solver. So you know, the, 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 there is simulation things that we as academics sometimes take for granted, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So uh, the elephant in the room, again, is you know, how do we uh, formally think about uh, the, this heterogeneity? And I spent many years uh, working on this. It ended up being my thesis topic. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to talk today about. In case you're interested, you know, uh, I have uh, several papers and ha would be happy to talk about it offline. Uh, but let's just uh, assume that we have you know, one modeling formalism and one uh, sort of uh, natural uh, semantic domain in which the behaviors make sense. So uh, then if you have a model and uh, a behavior that the model generates, for example, by pressing the simulation button, uh, then we can you know, define the semantics in terms of uh, like a Venn diagram, right? So in that behavior domain B of, say, one-dimensional continuous uh, trajectories in this case uh, with possible discontinuities, uh, then that particular uh, little behavior, uh, small b, is an element of that Venn diagram set. And if you had a way to, to figure out what the set of all possible sets are for all possible you know, parameter combinations, et cetera, then uh, you can call that blue circle as the you know, semantic interpretation of your model M in the behavior domain B. Uh, 
Analogously, you have specifications on the other side, uh, but here uh, we have uh, the opposite, where we, we know what is true uh, for the set of spec uh, behaviors that the specification allows, but we don't know what a behavior might look like, so you need to basically imagine uh, what uh, a B might look like. So, for example, for, for this uh, specification, this is a satisfying behavior. Uh, but so is this, right? And for both of these behaviors, you know, overshoot is no more than that, and settling time is less than that, right? So it, uh, on this side, we know what the behavior is, but we don't know the whole set. Uh, on this, we kind of sort of know the whole set, but don't know the individual behaviors. Uh, so with those Venn diagram notations, then we can uh, basically chart out the various verification problems. Uh, on the bottom left, uh, I, I sort of put theorem proving where we have specifications and we are trying to you know, formally prove uh, that we are staying inside this by showing maybe a conjunction of these clauses, right? Uh, so then the intersection is uh, guaranteed to be inside that set and then you can prove that you know, that set always holds, for example. Uh, there is a similar problem when you are comparing a blue set with the red set uh, of model checking, where you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a language inclusion of uh, mo the set of all model behaviors uh, being contained inside those allowed by a specification. Uh, and if you don't have uh, formal specifications, then you can still do something formal uh, in terms of uh, you know, comparing two models, uh, often called abstraction. Uh, which is a language inclusion property, but uh, you know, shown in terms of state-based properties such as you know, simulation relations, et cetera, because you can often uh, not enumerate all the, all the behaviors. Uh, you can also do some sort of uh, reachability computation, which is you know, trying to over-approximate this set uh, as, as tightly as possible, for example. Uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, if, if these are formal ones, uh, on the right-hand side, we have kind of, you know, s all the way at the other end, simulation, informal, you know, shot in the dark kind of thing, where you try a bunch of behaviors, and it's, it's not formal, no guarantees, but scales well, right? And, and, and the question is, can we do more with these simulation-based approaches uh, and add more formalism? So even though uh, you know, there has been progress made on this side, making it more scalable, uh, on the other side, there are uh, progress as well. So in the top, uh, top right quadrant, there is uh, you know, the, what the bucket I would call robust testing, where you're testing a few nominal trajectories, but you know, making a statement about uh, not just those, but a, a neighborhood of trajectories or behaviors around them. And uh, at the bottom, when you have uh, specifications, then you can do something like falsification, where you are uh, intentionally trying to find a behavior that sort of violates your specification. And uh, an analogous cousin of that problem is, uh, given the specification, given the simulation behaviors that you know, uh, can you try to learn uh, what the specification is, right? Uh, so for for. Formal methods, Congress, as as such, uh, this this whole bigger event, you know, all of these might be of interest, but for RV, sort of uh, this right side L might be the most relevant. So let me just briefly talk about uh, robustness uh, approaches based on uh, simulation techniques. Uh, I personally worked on a couple of them where uh, the the notion of you know neighborhood equivalence is either uh, given by uh, by simulation functions, which is like approximate uh, similarity of uh, a system with each uh, with itself, uh, as well as uh, sensitivity analysis in in, in these works. Uh, but there are many many other uh, approaches used by several other researchers, and uh, I'm not trying to be exhaustive here, but just uh, mention a few uh, highlights here. Uh, in particular, a highlight is that uh, this was adopted at Toyota, and uh, you know really this is the uh, you know, famous paper that they wrote about uh, simulation-based verification of embedded control systems, right? So, uh, of course, we being formal people, we would like to have formal specifications, right? So for specification side, uh, again, STL has been a success story, and thank you uh, to Dayan for this slide, uh, who presented this at uh, MTCPS workshop uh, at CPS week earlier this year. Uh, of giving the progress of how STL has evolved. And here again, you see uh, sort of industry adoption by Toyota as, as a sort of a big uh, success story. 
And in particular, they actually use the falsification uh, to, to find an actual bug in a large Simulink model where the bug was in a wrong value of a lookup table and the model was you know, more than 4,000 blocks. So uh, no, not, not a trivial model by any chance. Uh, so in terms of uh, adoption of you know, temporal logics or formal specification in the industry, uh, you know, the considerations are that engineers are lo not logicians, right? And, and so they do not speak the same vocabulary. And uh, of course, there is the heterogeneity stuff that I talked about. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, Joe Deshmukh, who was uh, back at Toyota when he gave this keynote, mentioned this as a grand challenge, where uh, how do you convey uh, you know, present requirements to control engineers and convey the interaction without using formalisms. And uh, here is our take on it. So uh, since 2019A, uh, which is uh, a little over six months old now, we have a way of, uh, you know, formally specifying requirements uh, within the simulation environment, uh, simulating test, uh, where, uh, you know, they look like natural language, English specifications are formal, and, and not only is that, you, there is a play button, so you can also execute them. So uh, in terms of authoring, you can just type SL test manager and it'll bring up this uh, test manager UI and you'll get you know, these templates. On the bounce check side, it, you know, it's just uh, specifying that your signal uh, stays within some bounds or outside of some bounds. Uh, if I wanted to be formal about it and write uh, in a paper, you know, I'll have to invent some symbols and you know, uh, it you know, stays uh, below A or above A, you know, those kinds of things. And, and some sort of uh, interaction uh, of and and or of these two things, right? And uh, of course, the, the, uh, you get a pictorial representation of what you're trying to specify here. And uh, you can refresh and get a new example of what, what a behavior might look like. Uh, but not just a good behavior, what a bad behavior might look like and a violation might look like as well, right? Uh, so that's the idea. And the good part is you can iteratively fold these uh, expressions and uh, your specification starts looking more and more like an in English language a sentence. Uh, uh, this uh, custom really means that the, the, the form, there's a, some Boolean expression that is true over all uh, simulation time. So T0 and TF being the start time and end time for simulation. And trigger response is really the temporal, uh, uh, simple temporal uh, formula that you know, oftentimes is, is really powerful and useful for industry practitioners, which is uh, saying uh, overall simulation time, uh, whenever you have trigger V1, then it, it implies that in certain time point in the future, uh, V2 as a response will be true. In the simplest case here, uh, you know, uh, the V1 just uh, evaluates to, you know, uh, at any point that V1 is true, you are e evaluating what's going on. Uh, but th there are more cases here where sort of the temporal notion is subsumed uh, while you define this, when, uh, you know, the v V1, something becomes true. You know, this is, this is a simple engineering concept, but it is kind of difficult to express in temporal logic because uh, you know, what is becoming enabled, right? Whereas it's a simple engineering concept of ri a detection of rising edge. So we sort of uh, make that easier for the user so they don't have to worry about these temporal uh, operators. Uh, in terms of the, the temporal, uh, you know, sort of the diamond modality here, uh, with no delay means that uh, both the lower bound and upper bound are zero. Uh, with the delay of at most means zero and some upper bound. And here, here it means uh, non-zero upper bound and non-zero lower bound and upper bound, respectively. And uh, for the response, again, uh, the simplest one says that, you know, at that point when you're checking this, uh, you have a response but there is also more temporal uh, ones with, you know, must state true for at least, at most, uh, in between some time period, and again, an until, which is another, uh, you know, uh, clause that you get right within the, within the response. And, and just to make that point clear uh, about, you know, folding and it looking like an English sentence, here is how it might look like, right? Uh, in terms of uh, symbol re uh, resolution and mapping, uh, the, the variables that appear in your specification uh, either can come from a simulation signal uh, in a model or uh, an expression which maps to some variable in your uh, workspace. So this could be time series data that you stored from the real world or from a previous example and you can compare them with each other. 
And uh, in terms of assessment and explanation in case of failure, you see uh, here uh, the expected behavior was something like this, but the actual behavior was that. And uh, you know, th this is some explanation in words where your simulation failed uh, uh, the specification. And uh, at the bottom you see uh, an expression tree where you can it again iteratively fold and unfold to, based on the level of interest. Uh, here is one that I find interesting uh, from our website, uh, where you know everything below is sort of uh, v1 and f uh, the above uh, part is v2. Uh, you you see you know formal things going on such as you know Minkowski subtraction and, and addition, but the user doesn't need to care about any of those things. Uh, we had to do some interesting things here. So for example, uh, here the specification says that uh, something must hold true for at least one second, but for the last one second, there is not enough time left. So we don't really know what's, what's going to happen. So it has had a third value of the Boolean, which is untested. We don't know what's going on. Uh, as well as on the top, you see something uh, for, the, for the logician, you know, uh, the, the implication always means, you know, not V1 or V2, but this is very confusing to engineers uh, where if V1 is false, then this expression is vacuously true. So then again, uh, we had to, you know, uh, on doing user experience studies, you know, introduce this, this notion of untested. So anytime where you don't see uh, the trigger being true, the, the response is untested rather than being vacuously true, right? So, and again, in, in, uh, in, in recent literature, there have been more work uh, in, in terms of addressing this vacuity by Dayan and others. Uh, in terms of uh, synchronization on the time axis, like I, I said, you, you can uh, you know, compare a simulation signal with the previously recorded things. Uh, and here again, the, the time points might not match, so you can do something like uh, intersection of the uh, time points where you have both signals and information about both. That's sort of the more restrictive ones. Or uh, you can do union where uh, you can you know, choose to compare when either of the two have signals. And when you uh, are using this union, uh, then you of course need to interpolate what's going on for the missing uh, timestamp, right? Uh, so again, uh, you can choose uh, either linear interpolation or, or uh, sort of zero order hold or sample or hold based on the semantics of what's going on in your model. These are mostly for continuous time signals and these are for sort of discrete time uh, equivalence. So the, the truly discrete time here where there is no interpolation is currently not supported, uh, which brings me to uh, the research challenge which I've uh, mentioned to Dayan and some of the others where we really need the interaction of you know, truly discrete and truly continuous time uh, and my, my colleague uh, Isaac Ito, who is now at MathWorks but also was previously at Toyota, uh, mentioned that we also need uh, discrete and continuous value in the value domain because you can have specifications where uh, gear equals two and you know, have something speed equals, right? So where one is purely discrete, the other is continuous. So here we might need something like uh, the equivalent of you know, a combination of STL and LTL, I don't know. Uh, but also, in terms of a signal processing uh, view, you know, needing to downsample and upsample might impact uh, frequency domain characteristics of your signal. So it might not always be reasonable to do things like these, right? Uh, and in a data flow domain, you cannot even insert or remove data uh, points these arbitrarily. So these are again research challenges for you know this community. Uh, for this section, you know, some of the references are listed here. So now let's briefly talk about how do we take it to operation time. This is going to be smaller uh, because the same similar concepts apply. Uh, so now we can basically take the model-based design V and make it into a square root, sort of, where you, you know after deployment you're sort of continuing to use model-based techniques. Uh, and uh, a prime example is the IoT, where you know you have a thing that is connected to the internet, right? So here an example is a toaster connected to the internet. Uh, and you can basically sense what's going on and announce it to the internet. For example, you know, toasting, done toasting, etc. Uh, this is a pet project of one of my colleagues, Hans Scharler. Uh, and this is uh, the other side, which is again a, a, a pet project of his, which is cheer lights, where you know the colors of all the lights are synchronized to whatever color people tweet at in this this channel, right? 
So that's just a, a toy concept, but uh, but it actually works in reality. And uh, when you when you take it to to sort of industrial Internet of Things, then this this connection to uh, uh, Internet becomes multi-hop, and you you might have. Uh, an asset that is not a, not just a tel, uh, you know a toaster or you know embedded device, but an actual cyber physical device uh, like a smart factory you know equipment or something like that. Uh, you can have a compute power either on the asset or n near the asset, uh, often called edge computing, and uh, you can have you know further on premises data center. Many companies have that, uh, and finally the the actual cloud provider, right? And uh, this maps nicely to what I showed as the, as the sort of agent-based, increasingly intelligent sort of functionality that you can uh, develop on those things. So uh, in terms of you know, taking all your, all your uh, runtime monitoring and analysis tools and making them uh, relevant at industrial scale, like large corporate scale, uh, the, the environment now consists of you know, several chip makers, uh, transport protocols, operating systems, uh, cloud providers, streaming protocols, and, and services for managing data, timing, uh, et cetera, and finally, dashboards, et cetera. So if you really want to, to take your tools at a corporate level, enterprise level, you know, they need to work with all of these, these kinds of things. So uh, back when I, I, uh, I was doing, you know, monitoring, runtime monitoring at Convince, you know, the, the applications were really simple, you know, sensing what's going on, uh, many, maybe lighting a few LEDs, and in case of a couple of really serious faults like low oil pressure or higher water temperature, just the only action would be to shut off the engine, nothing else. So it's really simple at that time. Uh, then when I was doing my internship at Bosch, uh, a little bit of the uh, edge compute uh, and an application was uh, basically non-intrusive load monitoring where you observe uh, what kind of uh, power signature you get uh, and based on that try to learn and identify which device is done on and off, right? And this, this had a nice connection to the work like shape uh, regular expressions you showed yesterday at Dayan uh, when I was thinking about it. Uh, but really, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about the whole uh, landscape, then on the left-hand side, uh, the considerations are, are really how fast can you do things, and on the right-hand side, it's uh, like how large of data can you deal with. So here it's speed, there is scope. And on the left-hand side, it, the notion is more product design. You're trying to design the CPS here, and you might do, uh, you know, model-based design. But on the right-hand side, it's more you know, service-oriented. I have this computer as a service. How do I use it right? uh, in, in an intelligent manner? So you might not use uh, you know, model-based design here because it's not necessary to do embedded design. You have more compute power. So here you can just you know, use, uh, use the computer as a service. So here uh, we have a, a, a additional offerings here in terms of uh, you know, using MathWorks Cloud. Uh, you know, either from our MATLAB uh, cloud or you know on third-party cloud providers like AWS or Azure, and here again it's as easy as basically remote desktoping into into these sessions and you know it's just firing up MATLAB, and you can do interesting stuff here. In term, uh, so it's not just monitoring, but you can do analysis of what's going on, uh, diagnosis in case of something you know not going according to plan or fault, you know FDI kind of fault detection isolation uh, applications. Uh, but not just in the past, you can also use uh, more additional uh, you know compute to do some predictions for future in terms of what you're observing and uh, what's going on here again. Uh, the applications would be predictive maintenance or you know estimating remaining useful life you know in terms of you know observing how much wear and tear you see in your part based on observed behavior and comparing with uh, the actual model uh, and uh, of course you can control and optimize and and the va value increases as you go up this stack uh, and here again, uh, a digital twin is uh, another buzzword you see, where you have you know uh, the computational model as the the twin of the actual physical asset in operation, uh, and and you can have uh, e either uh, a, 
a model you develop from the model based design time that you can reuse or you can uh, you know try to learn new models based on how you observe uh, the system in operation right so it could be data driven as well and then you can uh, deploy this model uh, while the system is running either on the edge compute or, or on your on prem devices to do these kinds of things right and and here again we have a reference example in terms of uh, you know a, a a triplex pump with uh, simulated, you know, leakage and blockage faults, and uh, uh, two two uh, example workflows. One is the fault classification uh, and you know detection of which which of the two faults is happening, and uh, so the other one is sort of a, a what if analysis where you're trying to simulate, you know, parallel simulations of you know hundreds or thousands of uh, uh, simulation instances. Uh, before before you actually do the thing, so what if I added more load? Will how will my system handle? You know those kinds of things you can do. Uh, so uh, in terms of research connections, I didn't have to go too far to look for research connections of all those things. I just went to the Google Scholar profile of my colleague Agung Julius, and I saw you know several uh, temporal logic kind of papers with that sort of map to each of these buckets. So like. Observation, occupancy detection, uh, diagnosability, uh, you know, fault detection, uh, controller synthesis, and finally optimization, right? Uh, so I'm sure all of your work also maps to you know some of these buckets, but the the challenge of uh, would be again to to make it you know enterprise scalable and things that handle. Uh, based on what you are doing, you know, large amounts of data or as fast as you can. And uh, here are some examples. So here is the, the predictive maintenance example that is already uh, available publicly on MATLAB file exchange, as well as some more uh, resources about, you know, reference architectures, et cetera. Uh, so in summary, uh, uh, like we saw, cyber physical systems continue to gain more intelligence and autonomy due to increases in computation as well as communication. Uh, you know, what systems we see now are open and interconnection, uh, interconnected and, and they change after deployment, so runtime verification is all the more relevant. Uh, formal specifications and uh, simulation-based approaches fill an important scalability gap uh, with respect to formal verification. Maybe all, like all of you know that, that's why you're here at RV, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. Uh, Model-based design approaches are being supplanted by model-based operation, uh, like digital twin and IoT in the novel workflows. And of course, uh, scalability to enterprise level systems will be the, the key value driver or enabler. So. Uh, with that, let me thank uh, the RV organizers again, uh, Leo and Bond, uh, for having me here. Uh, we had a very interesting duck stool on this topic. Uh, I see many of my colleagues who were there from that workshop. Uh, I had many useful, you know, fruitful discussions that shaped my perspective on this. Uh, and I want to thank some, some colleagues from, uh, from my team uh, who especially worked on these things and gave me valuable feedback on my earlier work as well as my uh, dry run of the presentation. So with that, uh, thank you.